The CIA is spying on Americans. Meta is threatening to pull from the EU. A couple of brief but important FOSS updates and much, much more this week. Welcome to Surveillance Report number 75, where we are dedicated to keeping you private and secure with the latest news. This report will recap some of the most notable events in the last week. I am Nathan from The New Oil. And I'm Henry from TechLore. This week, our affiliate link is going to be ProtonMail. Now, just a reminder to everyone, affiliate link, we pick these. ProtonMail is an encrypted email provider. They are based out of Switzerland. They recently passed, not really an audit, but a pen test this week, which we will talk about a little bit later. So we thought it would be a good reminder to, or a good time to remind you guys that ProtonMail is a great option if you're looking to get off Gmail, Yahoo, Outlook, whatever, and you're looking for an encrypted email provider. Of course, there are several options out there, but ProtonMail is a very good one to pick. And if you sign up to a paid plan using the affiliate link in, down in the description, then we will get a small kickback from that and that helps us keep going. And before we jump in this week, we have a quick announcement from Henry. Yeah, super quick. You might've already noticed I will not have video today, unfortunately, since I'm not in my home studio. And also I will not be here next week. So I will officially be in before all the people who say Henry's never here, uh, those comments. All right, we're gonna start with our highlight story, which is all about this fresh news story about CIA domestic surveillance. So quick disclaimer, this is a brand new story that is still unfolding. Uh, it just landed on my radar, I think like Thursday or Friday. We will almost certainly have more updates next week for you. You may have even read some new information by the time this publishes. A quick peek behind the curtain, we record surveillance report usually a day before it actually airs so it's saturday when we're recording this and then we post it on sunday night so if something comes out sunday morning please don't go in the comments and be like how come you guys didn't mention this it's it's because it happened after we recorded but if you bring it to our attention we will absolutely include it next week so don't panic and subscribe <laughs> yes and subscribe so you can see if we posted your update <laughs> Okay, so here's what we know so far. This story primarily comes from two U.S. senators named Ron Wyden and Martin Heinrich, and they are from Oregon and New Mexico. Both of them are members of the Senate Intelligence Committee. This seems to stem from a report in March of last year called Deep Dive 2, which was a watchdog report on the intelligence community operations under Executive Order 12333, which are, quote, rules for intelligence activities that Congress has left unregulated by statute, unquote. So basically, the intelligence community does actually have a, a whole section of orders where it says, we're just going to let you off the leash, but you have to come and tell us what you plan on doing so that we're kind of in the know and we can provide a little bit of oversight. Fun fact, this is the executive order that also forbids the targeting of specific American citizens. So the report is classified, but Wyden and Heinrich, having read the report, have basically made an open letter, it's kind of open, parts of it are redacted, that basically say, hey, based on this report, we think the CIA is operating outside of the law, and we don't think that they have actually like been reporting and keeping Congress updated like they're supposed to, and we think this report needs to be declassified because it contains information that's relevant to the American people. Specifically, it regards a, quote, secret undisclosed data repository that includes information collected about Americans, unquote. So, yeah, I mean, that's basically it, is they're claiming the CIA is spying on American citizens, which uh, the CIA is not supposed to do. If you guys didn't know this, the CIA and the NSA are both supposed to be foreign-focused agencies. They don't have any missions in the U.S. You will never meet a CIA operative undercover here in the U.S. because that is not their job. The FBI is the one that works inside the U.S., so the fact that they are spying on American citizens is extremely disconcerting because it means that they're going basically rogue. They're not paying attention to their mission and they're focusing on the wrong thing. In addition to all of the other concerns that come with this. The CIA claims that they have been uh, keeping Congress updated. They did disclose the program and they say that this whole incident is focused on the repository in question and the tools used to analyze it. Like I said, as we learn more, we will keep you guys updated. A few fun things that I, I read while parsing through the mul multiple articles here. According to the CIA, when analysts look up data on an American citizen, a pop-up box pops up to remind them that the search must have a foreign intelligence purpose, but the officials are not required to record what that purpose was. I mean, not to be crass, but it's like, you know, you go to a porn site when you're in high school and it pops up and says, are you 18? And you're like, sure. Maybe I'm the only one that did that. But yeah, I mean, it's it's useless. That's yeah, my it point. Was, it was definitely just you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
There is also, according to the EFF, no clear guidelines regarding the data retention or the oversight of this program because, the, in fact, I'll go ahead and read the quote. In the course of any lawful collection, the CIA may incidentally acquire information about Americans who are in contact with foreign nationals. When the CIA acquires information about Americans, it safeguards that information in accordance with procedure approved by the Attorney General, which restricts the CIA's ability to collect, retain, use, and disseminate the information. So in other words, they're saying it's inevitable that we're going to accidentally pick up information on the wrong people from time to time, which for the record, I accept that. But again, the, the EFF is saying there's no oversight on what do you do when that happens? Do you delete it? Do you keep it for 30 days, six months? Uh, you know, who's responsible for it? Just one last note, Edward Snowden kind of called that response before it came out. He tweeted, you are about to witness an enormous political debate in which the spy agencies and their apologists on TV tell you that this is normal and okay, and the CIA doesn't know how many Americans are in the database or even know how they got there anyways, but it is not okay, unquote. And then, yeah, we saw that already with the CIA saying, like, you know, it happens, we accidentally collect data. But yeah, again, we'll update you as we learn more, and right now it's just a, a big question of what do they have, what's the oversight? The answer is probably no oversight, but yeah, that's all we know so far. We'll keep you guys updated. All right, now we're gonna migrate over to the data breaches of the week, and we're gonna start with a breach of state database that may expose personal information. The Washington State Department of Licensing said that personal information of potentially millions of licensed professionals may have been exposed after it detected suspicious activity on its online licensing system. The particularly affected platform affects 23 categories of businesses and professional licensed by the department, including bail bond agents, funeral directors, home inspectors, and notaries. They don't know yet if any data was actually exfiltrated, and it may include outdated records too but we're just sharing to illustrate how poorly some agencies take security and how you kind of need to be proactive in the information you share with them from the get-go. All right, our next story comes from Puma. Yes, that Puma, who was hit by a data breach after the Kronos ransomware attack, which we're also gonna mention later on in the report. This is a trickle down from the Kronos ransomware attack that we talked about back in, I think it was right before Christmas time is when this happened. This affected employees and their dependents, not customers. So Puma was using this uh, cloud storage called Kronos Private Cloud, which Kronos describes as, quote, a secure storage protected from attacks using firewalls, multi-factor authentication, and encrypted transmissions, unquote. Kronos Private Cloud is used pretty frequently from enterprises to healthcare organizations and more. So unfortunately, this is kind of like a, what was that one Excelian last year that just like for six months we were seeing more and more companies step forward and be like, yeah, we, we're compromised too because of that. So we're probably going to continue to see that here in the next couple of weeks and months as more agencies step forward and say, hey, we got impacted too. So uh, it affected almost half of all employees. There were 6,632 individuals that had their data accessed. It's unclear if that's everyone who was affected or if it's less than that. The data included social security numbers and the affected individuals have been offered two years of Experian credit monitoring and insurance. Up next, a Croatian phone carrier data breach has impacted 200,000 clients. A1 Harvis, Har, Har, Harvataska, I'm ap I apologize. <laughs> Apologies in advance. Glad you took that story now, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> uh, so they exposed 10% of their customers' data. The details um, aren't super thorough, but the affected data does include full names, pins, physical addresses, and telephone numbers. As usual, they emphasize that bank details were not accessed. They, they, this is a quote. A1 Croatia adheres to the highest security standards and data protection. And we say, clearly not. They are a partner of Vodafone, who we will discuss later. Our next story comes from Ottawa. So for those of you who haven't heard, there are protests right now going on at the Canadian border and truckers are protesting vaccine mandates and they're basically refusing to deliver their cargo, which is holding up trade and they're kind of trying to strong arm the government into dropping the restrictions. That's what's going on. There was a GoFundMe set up to help support all of these truckers who were not completing their deliveries. And, you know, obviously, if they don't complete their deliveries, they don't get paid. So there was a GoFundMe set up. GoFundMe froze donations after there were allegations of violence. So there was another platform called Give, Send, Go, which set up donations instead. And Give, Send, Go appears to be the one who was compromised. This was caused by an exposed S3 bucket. Take your shot. It includes 50 gigs of data, including passports and driver's licenses. The address for the bucket was embedded in the source code of the donation page. Give, Send, Go has not yet notified victims, and they're, this was kind of funny, 
Uh, apparently, researchers found a text file that was left in the bucket by another unnamed researcher who warned that this vulnerability existed, and that file dated all the way back to September of 2018. So this has been around for a while, and they just have not acted on it. And, you know, also someone is incredibly sarcastic. And our final data breach of the week, DPD Group Parcel Tracking Flaw may have exposed customer data. DPD Group is a parcel delivery service with a global presence, shipping around 2 billion parcels annually worldwide. And researchers have found that they can use the parcel code API to get the recipient's map position on OpenStreetMap. This was fixed within a month of being reported, but who knows how long it was available. So it's kind of a different style of data breach, but it was still a fun one to throw in. That is all of our data breaches this week. We're going to move on to companies and we're going to start with, uh, I'm not going to lie, I had fun with this story. I, I laughed about it quite a bit. So Meta has threatened to pull Facebook and Instagram from Europe if it can't target ads. That's the headline. And it's uh, slightly misleading, but not really. So basically in the EU, they've recently decided that transferring the personal data of an EU citizen to the US violates GDPR because the US intelligence communities like the NSA and the CIA are so aggressive with their surveillance. So they can't do that anymore. Meta has tried to claim that if this becomes standard interpretation of the GDPR and this keeps happening and they don't reach some kind of new data transfer agreement, they will be forced to essentially shut down. They will have to limit a lot of their services in the EU because they will be unable to transfer data back to the US for processing. Therefore, the easiest way to comply is just to pull out altogether. I personally don't understand this. Uh, I don't understand why they don't just put a positive spin on it. Because what they would have to do in order to comply is build data centers in the EU, and then they can process user data there with all their algorithms and still push out targeted ads to everybody and say, look, we're making jobs and we're complying with privacy laws. Like, it's a win-win. I don't understand why they're trying to threaten and strong arm when they could just, maybe that's what they'll do next. I don't know, maybe that's my prediction. But anyways, here's the reason I love this story. Uh, German and French ministers have responded to this threat by saying, we're fine without Facebook, go for it. In my opinion, this is one of the most epic bluff calls of all time. Both of them basically said, uh, we both dropped Facebook and Instagram like four years ago for unrelated reasons, and we've been loving every minute of it. Life is great without Facebook, so you can go ahead and screw off and we'll be just fine without you. So we'll see how Facebook responds to that. It's another good reminder, if you haven't um, deleted your Facebook account and you're capable of doing so, um, go ahead and do that. It really is fantastic. I have, I have yet, and I, I, I say this every time, but I have yet to hear of someone who deleted their Facebook account and regrets the decision. The next story, the headline, Privacy Preserving Attribution for Advertising. Pretty, pretty vague. This comes from Mozilla, the people who produce Firefox, but we're sharing it here because it really concerns Meta and their relationship. So this flew under our radar last week, but we're making up for it by throwing it in this week. So Mozilla has been working with a team from Meta, aka Facebook, quote, for the last few months to create a, quote, privacy-preserving advertising technology that allows advertisers to get valuable visitor insight without harming their privacy. They call their result, quote, interoperable private attribution, or IPA. And they claim that it has two key features that preserve privacy. The first one is multi-party computation, which somehow, quote, avoids allowing any single entity to learn about user behavior, as well as data aggregation. They've already proposed IPA to the Private Advertising Technology Group, which is a part of the W3C, and they're also calling for feedback. So if you're educated on the issue, you can always feel free to submit whatever your thoughts are on it. I don't know, this is definitely um, I, I, very justifiably a divisive story a little bit. I, I think some people are either going to think that um, Mozilla is a, it's a massive red flag for Mozilla to even do anything with Meta, and some other people are going to think that um, there has to be some kind of compromise, and this might be a decent compromise uh, that we can establish today. Um, we're kind of skeptical, nonetheless, of partnering with Meta for anything that aims to be private. Um, so I don't know. I just don't know. I, I just wanted to be noted because I think I mentioned before that, like, I'm a Firefox user, you know, with the whole, like, Brave versus Firefox debate. But I, I'm kind of one of those people who falls in the camp of, like, this is a little bit of a red flag to me. And, um, you know, I, I guess we just, we talk all the time about, like, not being a fanboy beholden to one service. And for me, this is kind of one of those things where I'm looking at it, I'm like, I, I don't know, you're charting into some pretty sketchy waters, Mozilla, but I, I don't know, because there is a part of me that, that says, like you said, like there's a part of me that's like, Meta just wants to make money. And if they can continue to make money without invading your privacy, honestly, I think they're okay with that because all they care about is making money. The problem is they make money by invading your privacy. So 
by investing in something that's privacy preserving, they're shooting themselves in the foot. And I don't think that they have any willingness to cut into their profits at all, even just a little bit. So like, I, I don't know. I don't know what to think of this. And also just like, honestly, to me, this sounds like it's probably just some kind of like topics flock knockoff. Yeah, no, um, that, that's what this story was really reminding me of was um, Google's attempt at giving this privacy preserving ads. And it sounds very similar to that too. It's the kind of like, yeah. instead of being as specific to each individual, it's more grouping people up into just general groups that somehow still preserves privacy for each individual. So I don't and know. There's the whole aggregate data and you know, you can't identify the person even though like how many studies now have proven that's not possible. It's, I don't know. Yeah, I will say um, on the topic of like being a fanboy to one particular browser, the whole Firefox versus Brave debate, a ton of people distrust Brave because of Brave Rewards and their whole advertising strategy. So I just, I'm just, I just want to outline here. Firefox is collaborating with Meta for an advertising strategy. I, I just ask people to, I guess, hold both people to the same standards if you can. All right, our next story comes from Android 13. That's right. We're like 12 just came out. Like God, what six months ago? Not even and. They're already pumping away at 13. So Android 13 preview has come out for developers. And there are, so far we're aware of two privacy and security features that might interest our audience. They will include a new photo picker that gives users the options to limit which specific photos an app can see, similar to what Apple did with iOS 14. And they are removing the requirement that apps request access to a user's location when attempting to connect to a nearby Wi-Fi network. The article explained how that worked, but honestly, I didn't understand it. Uh, I. I don't know, whatever. Anyways, yeah, uh, apps will now be able to look for and connect to nearby Wi-Fi networks without ever requesting location permissions. So there will undoubtedly be more things to talk about as we learn more, but for now, that is what we know. And over to the iOS world, Apple says a, quote, small portion, end quote, of iPhones recorded interactions with Siri, even if you opted out. So Apple has acknowledged an iOS 15 bug that may have recorded interactions with Siri on some devices, regardless of whether the user opted out. The bug automatically enabled the improved Siri and diction setting uh, and dictation setting that gives Apple permission to record, store, and view your conversations with Siri. So um, Apple says that I identified this shortly after the release of iOS 15, and it stopped reviewing any recordings inadvertently received and is deleting info received from the affected devices. After discovering the bug, the company turned off the feature for many users and corrected the opt-in setting when it released iOS 15.2. Apple did not directly notify users or warn users to update. Um, definitely an interesting story. I do believe that it was a bug, but it, their response is very uh, weird. I think they could have definitely been a little bit more proactive considering they knew about this. It seems like pretty shortly after the release of iOS 15. I think that like the, the general takeaway here is to make sure you just full out disable things that could even be problematic if you can, right? Like we, we normally do encourage people to just disable Siri altogether, um, whether or not you're opted in or out to what we consider the superficial privacy toggles. And it's issues like this that are the reason we even call them superficial privacy toggles in the first place, just because it's really hard to have these things be privacy uh, friendly by default. And up next, um, still in the Apple ecosystem world, Apple has sent out patches that were actively exploited in WebKit, which is their uh, browser engine. So a zero day was in the WebKit engine, which allows attackers to exploit iPhones, iPads, and Mac OS um, devices that run Safari by executing code when the device visits certain web content. The update 15.3.1 is already available, so turn on automatic updates and disable JavaScript in your browser if you're able to. The article didn't specify, but that's the most common way of executing code via the web that, that like both of us are aware of. Our next story comes from Microsoft, who is blocking internet macros by default in five Office applications. So for those who have never used Microsoft Office before, macros are basically like scripts that will run and they can add additional functionality or features. They are very useful, but of course they also present a security risk because they can be used to access the internet and pull information like malware. So moving forward, Microsoft is disabling internet connectivity to macros by default. This is good. Users can still enable connectivity if the macro needs it, but since it's off by default, it'll be a lot harder for users to accidentally download malware. And just a real quick Microsoft story, Microsoft's February 2022 Patch Tuesday fixes 48 flaws and one zero day. So just our monthly reminder, if you're a Windows user, go ahead and update. And if no matter what kind of user you are, turn on automatic updates. Seriously, they're so important. Our next story, a data broker has millions of workers pay stubs. See if they have yours. 
So this article discusses the work number. That's, that's a company. It's an Equifax company, a red flag, that many other companies knowingly contribute payroll data to help streamline employment verification, thereby giving Equifax direct access to your salary information. I kind of want to stop right there and just um, really comment on that, that, that small but very important detail that you have companies like Facebook who own Instagram, right? People say, I deleted Facebook, but they still use Instagram. They still use WhatsApp. These are all Facebook companies, and it's still very legal and very possible for the parent company to essentially still own that data. This happens very frequently, and this is another example of that. So it's very important for all of you to really remember and keep in mind that there's parent companies to the services you use a lot of times. And it's, you have to really trust that company as well here, not just the company in the service. This is troubling as Equifax is a credit reporting agency, meaning they can use this information to further determine your credit score. And in an age of widening income and wealth disparity, this has troubling implications for the ability to control people financially. Equifax is even willing to sell the data to future employers, which can make leaving one job for a new one a difficult prospect when the new employer knows you're asking for significantly more than you made before. You can request your company to opt you out, but at this time there's no legal obligation for them to do so. Yeah, not a great situation for any people who are using the work number for payroll. Our next story comes from Portugal, where the provider Vodafone has had their mobile network knocked offline. And thank you to the reader who emailed me about this and has been keeping me updated. So this began on February 7th and affected 4G, 5G, digital TV, and SMS services. So pretty much everything. At this time, there is, quote, no evidence, unquote, of data compromise. The article has not named an attacker, so we're not really sure who's behind it at this time. The reader I mentioned who's been keeping me updated uh, said this morning that the attacker has been stalking a sys admin and co compromised their credentials and cloned their SIM card to steal the 2FA code. They didn't provide an article for that that I can cite, but uh, that's what they told me. And, you know, so far they've been pretty reliable, so that might be what happened. So the moral there, if that's true, remember TOTP, which is app-based two-factor, or a hardware token. Portugal is, by the way, slowly, of course, slowly re-restoring uh, services. So hopefully this will blow over soon. But yeah, big, big deal. Up next, we're gonna pivot to Brazil. Uh, Sao Paulo and uh, Rio airports are implementing facial biometrics for boarding. And I think we've actually talked about that they were planning on doing this or they announced doing this some time ago. And so now this, I guess, is more of a formal Implementation. Yes, thank you. Yeah. So the airport <laughs> operator and a state, <laughs> gosh, so the airport operator in, in Freiro, and, and I know I totally butchered that. Um, anyone who speaks Portuguese, I'm sure, can put a pronunciation down in the comments. Um, and a state-owned tech company, uh, Serpo, will be rolling out a, quote, fully digital boarding passes based on facial recognition in Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. This follows trials that took place starting in 2020 and involved over 6,000 passengers in two other airports. It expanded in late 2021 to involve over 200 cabin crew members. Quote, by using the passenger's personal data, social security number, and a photo taken on the spot, the Serpro application enables air airline staff to perform biometric validation at check-in by comparing the data and photo with the government's databases. After that, users can proceed to boarding gates and access the aircraft without having to present ID and a boarding pass, end quote. The reason why we threw this in here is we generally just like to update people on anything involving facial recognition and any kind of biometric uh, surveillance because it is ultimately surveillance regardless of its use. Um, but it's just worth for you all to know and keep in mind that there are concerns with this technology and many researchers are concerned behind some of the uh, possible issues that can arise from them. So. This is just an FYI to people in Brazil. And our last company story, this comes from the car maker Jaguar. Jaguar is adding Alexa capabilities for hands-free commands. Now, the reason I thought this was really interesting, first of all, we're sharing because, you know, we like to keep you guys updated on the spread of surveillance like Henry just mentioned. To me, it really struck out, stuck out as interesting because I have always believed that privacy is treated like a luxury. And obviously, I do not believe that it is a luxury. I believe it is a human right. But, you know, it, the fact is money buys you privacy. If you have money, you can buy a better higher-end phone that is less likely to spy on you or that you can flash your own custom ROM onto. You can pay money to like buy a house, which you can then get in a trust and you don't have to put your name on the lease and things like that. So, you know, money is really kind of the cheat code for a lot of things in life, but privacy is no exception. But now it seems like now 
it's just happening everywhere. I don't know, it's just, to me, it's interesting that like this is creeping so much that it's almost becoming a point where like it's not even a luxury anymore, it just is, you know, death and taxes as they say. There is some good news to this story. This seems to be an opt-in subscription-based service. So Alexa will be put on your device, but you still have to choose to pay for it to use it. I suspect, the article didn't specify, but I suspect that even if you don't opt in or subscribe, Alexa will still be I installed. So even if you don't use it, I suspect, I predict that in the future, we're gonna see a scandal where it turns out Alexa was harvesting location data and maybe even listening in on conversations, even for people who weren't subscribed. So that is my prediction. Stay tuned for that. With that, we will move into research and we're gonna start with a troubling story. Health sites let ads track visitors without telling them. So this is a study that comes from Duke University and Light Collective, which is described as a quote, patient privacy focused group, unquote. I'm gonna quote the article here. 10 patient advocates who are active in the hereditary cancer community and cancer support groups on Facebook downloaded and analyzed their data from the platform's off Facebook activity feature in September and October. In case you didn't know, if you're a Facebook user, you can do that. There is a button to request your data. Along with the retail and media sites that typically show up in these reports, the researchers found that several genetic testing and digital medicine companies had shared customer information with the social media giant for ad targeting. Continuing to quote the article, further analysis of these websites revealed which ad tech modules the companies had embedded on their sites. The researchers then checked the company's privacy policies to see whether they permitted and disclosed this type of cross-tracking and the flow of data to Facebook that can result. In three of the five cases, the company's policies did not have clear language about third-party tools that might be used to retarget or re-identify users across the web for marketing. So in other words, three of these five companies did not tell people we might, you know, share your your uh, genetic data and stuff with other companies. So the researchers focused um, on five consumer health related companies called Color Genomics, Myriad Genetics, Health Union, Invitae, and Citizen. Invitae acquired Citizen back in September, and the researchers said that those two companies, Invitae and Citizen, were the only two companies that had the most clear and comprehensive policies, but there is still room for improvement. And actually, once uh, you know they published the results and reached out to the companies, Invitae and Citizen said that they are suspending their use of Facebook ads and removing all Facebook trackers from their websites. So good for them, that's a start. All the other companies that they contacted made various cop-out excuses, like, I don't even remember any of them, I just remember reading all of them, and it's like, oh, this is PR speak, that means we're not gonna do anything. And you know, Meta itself claims that they're filter, they filter out and forbid health data sharing, which you know, not to continue with the obviously not trend, but how did it end up in the user's profile if you filter it out and forbid it? So you're clearly lying directly to our faces, which surprises no one. So yeah, um, that is unfortunate. Use use ad blockers, use uBlock Origin, um, you know, Brave Firefox. Like, there's there's things you can do that will severely reduce this amount of tracking. And now I'm gonna move on to the second research article. <laughs> Brute forcing passwords. Proxy logon exploits were some of the 2021's most popular attack methods. So based on the ESET's quarter three threat report covering September to December 21st, this article cite, uh, cites some of 2021's most popular attack methods of 2021. Among the ones that listeners can easily defend against, there's brute forcing, forcing passwords, remote desktop protocol vulnerabilities, Android banking malware, which rose almost 500% in 2021, and also Log4j. So those are all things that are semi-preventable. And the defenses here is to make sure you use strong, unique passwords. We recommend the password manager for a majority of people. Uh, good options are uh, Bitwarden if you want something that's cloud synced and KeePass if you want something that's local, both are open source. And we recommend staying up to date and utilizing automatic updates and also keeping just as few apps and services as possible on your devices. Um, typically less is more and minimalism will take you a very long ways in the privacy world. Our last research story, this is a bit of good news for people who like me are worried about the coming of quantum computing. So the headline says, breaking 256-bit elliptic curve encryption with a quantum computer. Don't let the headline fool you. This is good news. The short answer is no. Quantum computing is not going to break all of our encryption. This this comes from Bruce Schneier, and there's like a, a whole explanation with numbers and things that go way over my head. But basically, yeah, like we are not even remotely close to the point. Like even IBM's like super advanced best in the world research quantum computer is still not even close to breaking our current best practices for encryption. Again, if you're like me and you occasionally think about quantum computing and you're just like, man, everything I have is just gonna be cracked open in 20 minutes once that becomes scalable, it's not. But, you know, things change. So keep using good secure encryption standards. Don't use MD5, don't use DES. 
Always, uh, as always, keep listening to surveillance report and we'll let you know if any of that changes because the security landscape is changing. And, you know, if signal becomes uh, compromised or AES becomes deprecated and replaced with a better encryption, we will be certain to let, bleh, be certain to let you guys know. So yes, subscribe and keep up to date and you will never have to worry about quantum encryption. Also, quantum computing. this speaks to like, guys, math, it's math. Encryption is math. To, to yes, but I don't understand math. I'm bad at it. <laughs> True, but like people, you like people can prove math, and you can trust the people who are able to verify that. So when people spout BS, like signal is compromised, you're effectively saying that math isn't real. At the end of the day, like at least the encryption side of signal, right? Like you can you can go ahead, but even you know what? Even the phone number is hashed. Like so, technically speaking, signal doesn't quite know everyone's phone numbers, but people also dismiss that. Trying to like get factual with people who believe these things is very difficult. But it's the same thing with Proton Mail. People who think Proton Mail can read your emails, you're effectively saying that math just isn't math at that point. Oh. I'm gonna send you a video about the infinite hotel theorem. I made I... my partner so mad with that one. <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah. Um. I don't know. Just, just <laughs> everyone, everyone is listening. Just remember that encryption is math, and like math is is very like we have some of the strongest encryption that's just accessible day to day to everyone and it's really kind of a cool time to live in even with quantum computers around the corner all right um let's move on into politics so we already kind of got all of our political frustration out before the politics section this week so hopefully uh, this, this will be pretty quick um so we have a victory first off id.me is dropping facial recognition requirements for government services so for those who haven't been paying, been paying attention we covered how the irs has been requiring ID.me and it also implements facial recognition. And then the next week, it turns out that lots of government agencies are using this, not just the IRS. And now ID.me has vowed to drop all facial recognition requirements through government agencies. This is far from done though. So it's a great win, but it is far from done. There are still some federal agencies who use other services like Clearview AI. And also ID.me still services a large number of states that this uh, announcement does not apply to, as well as um, possibly any companies who rely on ID.me. So again, still contact your reps and express how you do not agree with this and um, still try to make an impact where you can. And on a similar note, Congress pressures more agencies to end the use of facial recognition after the ID.me um, issue. So several politicians are pushing the DHS to stop working with Clearview, citing concerns over low protest turnout and racial discrimination. This article also says that starting on March 1st, anyone with an ID.me account can delete their selfies or photos. So. It, I'm, I'm shocked, is all I can say. We're actually seeing, um, on the federal level, a lot of people trying to phase out um, these services, at least for government agencies. Um, but this does not apply to like local law enforcement, and there's still a, many other places where this technology is utilized. But it is kind of a small win in the scheme of things. Our next story is just an unfortunate quick update on the Earn It Act. The act has made it out of the Senate Judiciary Committee and onto the Senate floor, which means that at any point now, the Senate can vote on this act. Or uh, the EFF even pointed out they could do this really weird thing that I've never understood in politics, where they can basically tack it onto another bill that is almost certainly going to pass. But don't panic, because that's exactly what happened last time, too. So it's not too late. Again, just like with the ID.me thing, be sure to contact your representatives, tell them you are staunchly against the Earn It Act, and if they vote for it, you will not be voting for them. And it is an election year, by the way, so that will probably have a little bit of weight this year. Next, the Department of Defense is prioritizing open source software, and here's how open source projects can benefit. So in a memo from January 26th of this year, the CIO of the DOD suggested some ways to help harden the open source solutions that the DOD is reliant on. This memo is because the CIO recognizes how deeply embedded um, open source software is everywhere, including in the DoD, and it also contributes a large amount of it via various projects like DARPA. So in this new memo, the CIO recommends researching and using open source solutions before proprietary ones and, quote, only creating new non-commercial software when no off-the-shelf solutions are adequate, end quote. It also says that um, open source meets the definition of quote, commercial computer software, end quote, and is required to be given, quote, equal consideration with proprietary commercial offerings, end quote. This means that open source devs now have a shot at scoring a lucrative DoD contract for funding, which is very exciting and can actually maybe um, allow some of these open source projects to be better than their proprietary counterparts. I'm also excited just with the whole, um, you know, you have to go to open source first, and only if that doesn't meet your needs can you move on to something else. Like, having been on the inside, I guarantee you there's going to be some people who already have their eyes set on this commercial solution, and so they'll be like, yeah, we checked, it doesn't work because, you know, I don't like where the 
save button is located or something stupid. But for the most part, I've said before, I'm a big fan of like, I don't understand how taxpayer money can be used to pay for proprietary things. So that's the part I'm super, super excited about. Yeah, and like changes- I guess that's kind of selfish, but- <laughs> it, it is, but like, it's fine. Like, I think a lot of people feel that way and like change is slow in the US. So yeah. if we ever do move to a fully open source stack for like anything government related, this this is like part of that journey, you know, if, if that's like the future. Fair. All right, our next story comes from Canada, and this is just a real quick signal boost. The headline says, tell Trudeau no to mobile device tracking. We've mentioned in the last few weeks how Canada is considering tracking mobile data as they are coming out of lockdown. I believe they're coming out of lockdown to uh, basically understand how Canadians are reacting to lucid, loosening COVID restrictions. This is a petition for Trudeau to entirely reject this proposal because originally it was proposed and then the House of Commons was like, well, we want to hear more about how you're going to protect privacy. And these these people are basically coming together to say, no, like, no, no, no privacy, no nothing. Just no, don't do it. And additionally, they are calling for stronger privacy protections. So if you are a Canadian citizen, be sure to check this out and consider signing it. With that, we will go to Australia, where Queensland has dumped COVID-19 check-in apps for most venues entirely. I'm going to quote the article. Queensland government announced on Monday it is scrapping the state's COVID-19 check-in app at all businesses that do not require mandatory vaccination for their customers, unquote. So that includes taxis and rideshares, retail, supermarkets, gyms, salons, etc. So... Anywhere you go in Queensland, if they don't require a mandatory vaccine to be in the building, then you um, you don't have to use the check-in app. I think that's just a really good positive update. Uh, when the pandemic began, I predicted, and I'm sure Henry did too, that it was going to be 9-11 all over again. We're going to see this massive loss of civil liberties in the name of safety and keeping everyone safe, which, you know, keep everyone safe, I, I understand. But the problem is it's not going to get rolled back. It's not going to be temporary. It's going to become the new norm. Cough, cough, TSA. So it's good to see at least some of this stuff is actually being rolled away in some places, and maybe we're wrong. I mean, it's still too early to call that, but it's good to see some of this stuff going away as the pandemic starts to, we start to get a better handle on COVID and stuff like that. And to stay in Australia, um, the Australian DTA's digital age verification tool is being considered for online pornography, documents show. Age verification trials are underway for online gambling and alcohol sales. They could be expanded to include online pornography as the federal government looks to restrict sexually explicit content on the internet from underage children. The roadmap is expected to be presented by the end of the year. This seems to be part of a larger push for digital centralized uh, identities called the quote, Trusted Digital Identity Framework or TDIF. So it's kind of a central uh, place to verify people uh, on a government wide level. This facial recognition tech is being, quote, actively considered. There was also debate about if age verification should be used to upload content as well as access it. There aren't any details at this time because it's so early on, but um, I think I speak for pretty much everyone in the privacy community that Australia is constantly heading in a very dark place privacy-wise. Um, they're pretty much heading to a completely identifiable internet if, if what they're trying to do actually falls through. And also Nate's about to cover something else uh, regarding pretty much a similar story. Yeah, I, so I tack this on here because it's very, very similar. The UK, UK.gov specifically, is threatening to make adults give credit card or passport details to access Facebook and TikTok. So again, this is very similar. This comes from the latest revision of the UK's online safety bill, which I think originally had this and then they dropped it because everyone hated it and now they're bringing it back again. It's, it's the same thing. You know, they also want to add an age verification to look at porn. I understand some people are very anti-porn and, you know, if we can all be grown-ups for a minute, I don't have an issue with it, but I do understand that the industry is very uh, predatory, which I, I think we are fortunately seeing uh, that kind of lose its hold a little bit with the rise of things like OnlyFans and, you know, like creators to be able to make their own content for themselves. You know, the thing about porn is it's, it's like an action movie. You have to understand that that's not how sex actually is. And therefore, I, I understand that there are concerns about people getting those wrong ideas stuck in their head. But all that said, like, regardless of which side you fall on, this is still very concerning because this is linking people to their online activity. And whether that's the porn you look at or whether that's the comments you make on on social media that's a very slippery slope to fall down because we've seen this is almost like a why I care about privacy thing <laughs> like we've seen multiple times in the past that when people know that they're under surveillance they behave differently and that can lead to having negative effects that can lead to people um the the biggest example that sticks out in my head was after edward snowden came forward 
the number of searches regarding the war in Iraq and Afghanistan dropped dramatically because all of a sudden people didn't want to get themselves on a list because they were trying to learn the latest news. And personally, I find that very problematic because if you're not free to, if you're scared to educate yourself on this kind of stuff because you don't want to put yourself on a list, then like that that's certainly one negative impact. And, you know, like on, on a more liberal note, like, you know, if somebody who's LGBTQ is trying to do research about this, but now they have to like submit identity verification because technically that's, you know, not safe for work, uh, adult content, I guess technically maybe some, some sites could be considered that. Like now that's, you know, that could discourage them from doing research because they don't know. They don't want to tie their identities to that possibly, especially if they live in a, a conservative area that's hostile towards those kind of things. So yeah, it's just the, the whole idea of providing your identity to get on any kind of internet is just very problematic, whether that's porn, whether that's social media, whether that's the entire internet in general, it is a form of control and it has the potential to be abused. And even if in, in some magical universe it's not abused, it has a psychological effect in the people who are under it. So, yeah. Yeah, I think you put that really nicely, um, especially for people who might be catching this podcast for the first time, who've never heard um, any anything regarding privacy. But like just a, just another way of looking at what Nathan said. If you believe in democracy, privacy is pro democracy to the core. Like it's hard to live in a true democracy without privacy. They're 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 just two ideas that are just are so in, in, intertwined. So it's just hard to envision a world where everyone is truly free to express who they are and be themselves without a layer of privacy. And that's kind of like that's dependent like a democracy is dependent on people being able to express their own individual beliefs if you want to learn more about privacy we recommend uh glenn greenwald's ted talk um there's privacy guides which is a website that goes through a lot of resources um you can watch you can look at the new oil which is nathan's website or TechLore, which is the website of, um that probably where you're, you're listening to this from if you're on youtube and it's a good place to end that's kind of the end of politics um if we go ahead and we're going to migrate uh we don't have many more stories left it's kind of a long week um, we're going to go into the open source world, FOSS, FOSS News. First one is from Signal. Signal has released a new feature that allows you to change your phone number. So now it's pretty much what it says. You can change your phone number without creating a whole new account. This does not seem to work if you're getting a new number, but only if you're getting okay. a new phone and a new number. Got it. Thank you. So this is this does not work if you're getting a new phone and a new number, but only if you're getting a new number for your, your existing device with a Signal account already on it. Um, I think everyone is kind of excited about it, but also we're still waiting for like a username set up so that you don't have to even rely on phone numbers in the first place. Which, by the way, I, we've actually seen a few comments of people who are like, this this show is just shilling Signal. <laughs> first off, we're not paid anything to talk about Signal. Either way, like Signal is a massive nonprofit organization. Like we have nothing to do with Signal. Um, but also, like, we still like to criticize services when it's needed. But at the end of the day, Signal is just a fantastic service uh, for a lot of things. And it fits a lot of threat models very nicely. But we still think that it would be fantastic for them to drop their phone number requirement. I was going to say, for the record, that's a criticism right there. Is like, just because we're not saying, like, delete Signal, it's trash, doesn't mean we're not criticizing it. But it's like, hey, you guys have been promising usernames for, God, what, like, two, three, maybe even more now, years? Like, when are you guys going to do that? Yeah. Like, it, it's still a criticism just because we're not telling you to pick up the pitchforks. Exactly. And and that's the confirmation bias I was talking about earlier. If you're someone who believes that Signal's compromised and we're not on the same boat as you, you now think that we're somehow pro, like super pro Signal and, and are unable to criticize it. And if you're someone who's super pro Signal and we even bother to criticize it a little bit, you're going to think that we're super against Signal. And because th we know this happens because some of you we see the same comment regarding the same story and people interpreted it literally the exact opposite way. You should look in the confirmation bias if you don't know what that is and you listen to our podcast. It'll probably make you a lot less angry about the stories we covered down the road. Speaking of that, we will now talk about Proton, where security experts have declared all Proton apps secure after they pass their pen tests. So I'm gonna quote the article, Sec oh God, now it's my turn to get a weird one. Securitum? Securitum? I think so. Securitum is a leading European IT security company handling security audits and tests for many of Europe's largest companies. They also handled the security audit of the new Proton Mail and Proton Calendar in early 2021. Unquote. So in September 2021, Proton hired Securitum 
I don't know why I feel like I'm pronouncing that wrong, but that looks right. Anyways, Proton hired Securitum to pen test all the Proton apps and they found no major issues or vulnerabilities. So this isn't exactly an audit, but I mean, still like they, you know, Proton apps are open source and they paid them and said, have at it, you know, see whatever you can find. And they didn't find anything. So that's good. Again, one of my readers on Twitter pointed out Proton should still publish some kind of actual white paper for the more technical people because they did post like, what is it like letters of attestation or something, which is basically just, you know, the researchers being like, hey, we tried and we didn't find anything. But, you know, it it would be nice for them to post a more technical, like, here's exactly what we did. Here's what we tried. Here were the results. Uh, it would fly right over my head, but I think it would be really cool for a lot of the more technical people, especially the people who are constantly spouting these unfounded allegations that Signal or Proton is a honeypot. Have I been saying Proton or Signal? I think you said, I don't know. I think it's been Proton. Okay. Well, if I said Signal, I apologize. Um, but yeah, you know, it's uh, just, not just, like that's really going to change their minds. I know, exactly. Still. You just can't talk to these people because like all of their allegations on, are based on just unfounded, they're unfounded allegations. Like there are already people who, are, who don't believe in uh, like any kind of research because they'll say, oh, they handed over an IP address, even though Proton has a, a blog post from 2014 saying that in a federal investigation, they might be forced to log an IP address for users. But I think at the same time, it would offer more, um, more reassurance for the people who are open-minded, you know, because then like- Definitely. I don't know. I don't want to rant too much, but yeah, basically yeah. like when you see somebody saying like, Hey, here's the technical breakdown of all we did. And when someone else technical comes along and goes, wow, that was really thorough. And they really did a good job. Like, yeah, you, you walk away going like, Oh, I guess it's pretty secure. Whereas, you know, when they just say like, well, we looked and we didn't find anything. It's like, okay. Well, what did you look like? If I say I looked for my car keys and I didn't find them, did I, did I only check where I always put them? Did I check my pants from the day before? Did I check my backpack? Like, yeah, well, I don't know. Yeah, that's kind of how I look at it. Yeah, I, I agree. I totally agree with you. But the implication is that the person you're dealing with actually wanted to listen to the story and actually assess it on a critical level. And the people yeah, who just fair. think Proton <laughs> is a honeypot do not are and are not able to do that. Yeah, <laughs> like, that's fair. And and I'm calling you out because I know that we're gonna get a comment on this video saying I can't believe that you guys even covered Proton Mail because it's a honeypot. And you're the person who literally cannot think critically about the situation. <laughs> and I like, there's just no other way to list to say it. Like we have all of the facts today. Like we know what they handed over to the court. We know what they said beforehand. We know what they did after. And we know what they collect. They put published transparency reports. It lines up with the court cases that we receive. We, everything, everything's open source. We can verify the math and what happens and what they can access, what they can't access. But everything's but Henry, out there. <laughs> but Henry, I read an article that said, if you play six degrees of Kevin Bacon, then Signal was founded by the CIA. Or yeah. Proton, whatever. Yeah, I'm, I'm an avid Neocities blog reader. <laughs> um, dude, it, man, if we're, if we're going to really uh, ruffle some feathers, it's going to be this one. I don't think we've ever gone this off the rails with the surveillance support. I don't think we're going to do this every week, but I think we, we, we just we got caught on the wrong weekday to do this podcast today. All right, and now we're going to migrate into misfits. So the first article, weeks after a ransomware attack, some workers still worry about their paychecks. So this is really just to outline that there's this, there's this idea that people have that you get hit by a ransomware and y your options are, oh, okay, I have cyber insurance and I'm just going to get reimbursed or I'm going to pay them and I'm going to pay the ransom and I'm going to be fine. It's not that simple. These cyber attacks are devastating, right? Like, even if you pay them back and they unlock your data, you still might have suffered days, hours of all of your systems down. You might have lost a lot of money. You might have lost uh, customer data. Sometimes they don't even give you your data back after you pay. And a lot of people don't pay the ransom. This is another example of that. So the Kronos ransomware from December took place right before Christmas. And this article is talking about Coca-Cola employees who still have not been paid because of this. So there are, there are always fallout effects of these attacks. They aren't just remedied within the week, which is what companies um, want you to think because they don't want people to be, um, they don't want people to question that the service isn't safe anymore and people want to recover ASAP. But these things tend to have months, if not years of effects. So that's kind of why we put this in here. I just want to drill home on that point. Long time listeners and fans may know, like uh, last year I was caught in Texas during the winter storm. It, it really kind of changed my perspective on the idea of disaster prepping, which I've always done a little bit of, you know, like I, I keep some bottled water in the, the pantry just in case. And like, you know, I have a savings account and stuff like that. But like 
we're seeing everything becoming more and more digital. And the I, I think the idea of disaster prepping is something that we should all start jumping on because it's not just about, you know, what if the zombies rise up? At this point, it, at this point, my biggest concern is literally becoming ransomware because we've seen the Colonial Pipeline happened last year. We've seen um, just recently, like a couple weeks ago, there's supermarkets in Europe that are like empty shelves because of supply chain attacks on ransomware. There was the, like, shell, the shell, the gasoline shell attacks in Germany. No, there was, this is a different one. Oh, oh, I'm saying, yeah, I'm, I'm adding a third one. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. R uh, shell attacks like in, in Germany, like, and then, you know, we've seen, I think Iran or Ukraine or something had like all their gas stations shut down. Like uh, we've seen uh, uh, AT uh, ATMs, maybe that's the Ukraine one I'm thinking of, like ATMs that don't work. So you can't even like, you can't even hit a point where it's like, oh, all the card machines are shut down. Like, let me go take money out of the ATM. Oh, that doesn't work either. So like, I, I hate to say it, but I, I think we're kind of entering a world where I, I think it's going to, you know, get darker before it gets better, to be totally honest, not to sound pessimistic. But so, I mean, we got to start thinking about like, you know, just just keep that in mind. Like I've gotten to the point where I used to fill my car up at a quarter of a tank. Now I do half a tank because, you know, what if tomorrow I wake up and all the gas pumps are shut down because of ransomware and, you know, I, I take cash out every paycheck because, again, what if I wake up tomorrow and all the ATMs are down because of ransomware and Unfortunately, I, I think that's the world we're moving into. Yeah, but... I, I, and I fully agree. Actually, um, I recently I, I recently started using Crypty. It's like my new note taking thing. I've never used a note taking thing. People notoriously know I only use Signal Note to solve for things. But I finally I a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do too still. But like I actually have a formal note taking app, and I chose Crypty. I really like it, and um, I have a whole prepping doc now, and I'm going to start implementing things. I'm um, there's actually a lot of overlap, I think, in the... Oh, there's so much. Yeah, in the prepping and privacy community, not only in the digital world, but in, in the physical world as well. I think a lot of people who believe in ownership and um, and things like that, really, it lines up well. And so, like, I'm, I'm the same way. So I, I have an electric car, so, like, previously I sometimes would get home with 20% battery, but I haven't been doing that recently. Um, I will now charge all, as much as I can, so I always have battery. I recently got, like, a, a mm -hmm. solar battery pack as well. Um, nice. so I can still oh, yeah, charge, you showed me that. Yeah, so I can still charge some of my tech devices um, in case anything goes out. Um, That's just, the next big thing we're looking at here, too. Yeah, I really recommend it's it. It's been really great. So um, just for people who are listening, if you want a really simple get started, um, I, I think it's getready.gov or bready.gov. There's an official U.S. government website that goes over like some of the basic mm -hmm. um, preparation that you can take, and it's like, Formal advice being given that's been trusted, and it's very safe advice that we can recommend you all too. Um, but there's also prepping I could do like communities. like a whole episode on prepping. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's a fun thing, and there's lots of prepping communities out there that um, just go ahead and uh, check them out, and who knows, maybe we'll cover it someday to ourselves. Our next story is a real quick one. Uh, the headline says FBI warns SIM swapping attacks are rocketing. Don't brag about your crypto online. The title really says it all, and there are two lessons to take away here. Lesson number one. TOTP or hardware token. We've mentioned that several times, but you know, don't use SMS two factor. It's terrible. It is super deprecated and experts agree it sucks. It's better than nothing if that's the only thing it offers. Well, if that's the only thing it offers, find a better exchange, number one. Use app-based two factor or use hardware two factor. And number two, don't put a target on your back. Don't go out and brag about how you just bought a thousand dollars in this cryptocurrency that's still on the up. And you know, in two weeks, they know it's gonna be worth five thousand dollars and come steal it so don't put a target on your back and i guess number three don't use online crypto exchanges you know if if you're gonna hold if you're gonna hold on to it then definitely put it in an offline wallet that's the most important thing uh, yes like, honestly like because that it, is very very important yeah unless you own your seeds you don't own your crypto our next story comes from a baby monitor company called Nui, who has zero day vulnerabilities that could allow video feed hijack I'm gonna quote the article. Security vulnerabilities and baby monitors from Nui could allow attackers to either access the camera feed or execute malicious code on vulnerable devices, unquote. This came from researchers from Bitdefender who discovered four separate remote code executions on two models of monitor, but they didn't check any of the other models, so there could be many, many more out there. The article goes into detail on each vulnerability. The app for Nui devices has between 50,000 and 100,000 downloads on Google Play, so it is a relatively popular manufacturer. They use AWS for storing recordings, so go ahead and pour your shot. I'm sure we'll be taking it soon, especially now that this article's been published, because this has not been patched. Nui has not, uh, not commented. They have not responded to attempts to reach them, so actually researchers are publishing this to try and pressure them into fixing it because they were unable to get a hold of them. And unfortunately, the article suggests that these exploits are very easy to pull off. Yeah, prep your shot, and we'll see if they show up in next week's data breaches. 
And our final story of the week. Ooh, man, we got through it. So ExpressVPN is offering $100,000 to the first person who hacks its servers. Title says it all, there are three conditions. It must be a VAD vulnerability, granting unauthorized access or exposing customer data, only eligible for vulnerabilities in the server, and activities must remain, quote, in scope to the trusted server platform. The trusted server is a custom built operating system based on Debian Linux, featuring proprietary security enhancements that make it ideal for use in VPN infrastructure. Um, if any of our viewers crack it after watching this, we will gladly take a 10% finder's fee. Honestly, uh, it's kind of the story. I don't have too many thoughts. I think it's it's kind of cool. It's great PR for ExpressVPN, but it doesn't take away so many of the recent concerns uh, regarding ExpressVPN. Um, it's still not a VPN we recommend, um, generally speaking, but yeah, still cool. It'd be cool if other VPN people did the same. I guess it just uh, builds more trust in the product, which is exactly what they want us to say. I mean, I, I think other VPN companies do offer bug bounties. I think this one is making headlines just because I, I think the article said this is actually the highest bug bounty ever offered by a VPN. And that was all of our news this week. It was quite a bit of a week. It did not seem like that much when I was writing out the notes, but yeah, that turned into a lot of stories. Uh, so, you know, we've got the CIA surveillance thing, which again, we're just hearing about that. We will definitely keep you guys updated if more information comes out, which I'm fully expecting more information will. Ton of data breach we've got meta trying to stare down the eu and we'll let you know how that turns out we had a quick update on the earn it act which again we will keep you updated on that as well hopefully the update will be it's dead again so yeah um just lots and lots of stuff and there will be more to come this this stuff is always constantly changing so as always stay subscribed and we'll let you know. We want to remind you guys that our promo spot this week is our ProtonMail affiliate links. So if you're, again, if you are not on an encrypted email provider, if you're already found one that works for you, whether that's like Postio or Mailbox, I think is one, uh, Tutanota, C Templar, like if you found one that works for you and it's private and it's secure, great. Like we're not saying you have to use ProtonMail, but if you're still using Gmail or Yahoo or whatever, get off that, switch over to something good. And if you decide that a paid Proton Mail plan is right for you, then we'll get a small commission from that and it'll help us keep going. Thank you guys so much for listening to Surveillance Report. We are happy to know that you're trying to stay safe out there. The final thing we want to ask of you, as always, share the podcast around. Give us a rating, make sure you're subscribed, send it to a friend's family, whatever the case, we are trying to reach as many people as possible with the message of privacy and every little bit helps. So thank you guys very much for listening and we will be back. Well, I will be back next week and then Henry and I will both be back after that. So have a good week.